Good afternoon, everyone. Happy March 12th to you. Happy Tuesday. May I get a thumbs up, uh, clap, emojis, whatever you want to do. It's in the bottom right of your screen to let me know that you can see and hear me. Okay. I'm seeing all the little purple and magenta thumbs ups and clappings that are happening on the screen. So thank you very much for validating that. So again, good afternoon. I'm Kelly Fornell, the CEO of Tech Manitoba, and I want to give you a warm welcome to Optimizing Everything with AI, our tech mashup for March. Um, this is going to be a very exciting one. And before we get into that, I would like to start with the land acknowledgement. So in the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge that Tech Manitoba is located and operates in Winnipeg on the ancestral lands of Treaty 1 territory. This is the original lands of the Anishinaabe, the Inuak, the Ishininawak, the Dakota, the Diné, and the homeland of the Red River Métis. So we seek to cultivate better relationships with Indigenous communities, companies, um, and in the spirit of um, our vision, which is to make Manitoba's tech sector the most diverse, equitable, and inclusive in Canada, we really see that the activities that we do need to address the ongoing barriers for Indigenous Manitobans, women, and newcomers to make their way into education, employment, and entrepreneurship that helps to support and grow our tech ecosystem. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I was going to start by talking about a couple of the upcoming events that we have, which are really, really exciting. Um, but myself and our very, very um, illustrious speaker here today, we both use Macs. And Macs sometimes can be a little bit finicky when it comes to the Remo platform. So what I'm going to do is I am going to um, call on to the stage uh, Dr. Jason Figa. And um, while we talk about his um, illustrious uh, background, We'll, we'll give him time to get everything ready. And should there be an, any issues, which I'm sure there won't be, then I can um, talk to you about the events. So Dr. Jason Figa is a scientific computing data modeling, optimization, and simulation expert with over 25 years of experience. He is the inventor of NCUBE's AI-guided evolutionary optimization and data modeling platforms. And he leads their product development in the casino industry, which includes AI-driven slot floor optimization, player segmentation, and predictive AI systems. So I'm not sure if you've heard of NCUBE data science before, but um, we're going to hear um, a lot about some of the insights there from doc Dr. Jason Figa today. He is also um, the University of Manitoba, the Associate Professor of Astrophysics. So please help me in giving a very warm welcome on the remote platform, which will work just fine for Jason. We'll give you that, that moment to get you started. Thanks, and thanks we, Kelly. Are you able to see my screen? We can, so I'll hop off. Thank you, Jason. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, Jason Figa. Uh, I'm a, a CEO of NCUBE Data Science uh, Inc. I'm going to be giving this talk today about optimizing everything with AI. Um, hopefully, by uh, by the end of the talk, you'll understand why I'm so excited about optimization methods, especially those that uh, are powered by by artificial intelligence techniques and how it's become a lifelong passion for me and why it's actually so important for a lot of business uh, and a lot of studies in in academia engineering and elsewhere so uh, I think I uh, Kelly already uh, introduced me so I'm uh, I'm CEO of NQ but really I spend most of my time inventing technology while my partner uh, Anastasia Barron who's here in the audience uh, does most of the uh, the more business related things um, I've been uh, inventing and implementing algorithms for uh, various kinds of numerical computing for about 30 years. Uh, and about the last uh, 22 or so uh, have really been um, focused heavily on inventing and implementing uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, which I use for all kinds of things, both uh, in academia and also in, uh, in industry. Um, the uh, I, uh, we, we, uh, in uh, in Ncube, um, I'm the main primary inventor of our real AI slot for optimization software for the casino gaming industry, and I'm going to be drawing on some examples from uh, from this uh, this tool throughout the talk because it's really I think a nice example of how multiple artificial intelligence systems work together uh, to do something that's rather unique uh, in a, a very data intensive industry. So uh, the tag phrase I, I often like to use is that I was doing AI long before it was cool. Uh, and of course, we've seen a, a huge uh, increase in the amount of AI uh, in uh, in the last couple of years since the rise of ChatGPT and other large language models. Uh, I've been focused more on numerical kinds of algorithms uh, for uh, much, much longer than that. 
Uh, a little bit about NCUBE. Um, you know, as uh, was mentioned, uh, we primarily develop uh, AI applications for the casino industry. And we were really uh, one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence in gaming, uh, starting uh, in this area in 2016 with the initial prototypes of our real AI slot floor optimization system. Um, back in 2016, and you know, really up till the last the last few years, nobody in this industry wanted to talk about artificial intelligence, and now it's all anybody wants to talk about in this industry. And I like to think that um, uh, Stacy and I uh, had something to do with that, with uh, our pioneering work in artificial intelligence, really introducing people in the industry for the first time to these kinds of techniques. Um, in Enki, we also consult uh, uh, consult in gaming, do kind of special topic, special research projects in gaming, um, and uh, also some uh, some related uh, fields. So we're a small but tech heavy company. Uh, we really focus on creating uh, uniquely powerful art, um, uh, uh, intellectual property and deploying it for uh, a relatively small number of major customers. So before I get into the uh, some more technical material, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to tell you a story. So. It was a very short story, but it was 22 years uh, in the making. Um, back in uh, 2002, I was work working for uh, the National Research Council out in Victoria, uh, BC, at the uh, Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics, basically an observatory and really one of Canada's uh, preeminent um, facilities for, for astrophysics. And while I was there, um, I ran into a difficult data modeling problem. So what do, what do I mean by data modeling? Basically using optimization methods to fit a, a math or physics model to in this case, an astrophysical object to understand its structure. Um, this doesn't sound maybe that difficult from the uh, the outside, but um, it was it was it was challenging. Um, all the standard methods that I tried on this uh, failed, and they they failed badly. During this time period, uh, I created some of the most confusing graphs and plots and results that I've ever created in my in my career. And at that point, I just knew that I needed a different approach. So I used to bike. I used to bike to work. It was 18 kilometers uh, in each direction, so I had a lot of time to think on the way home. And one day, I had one of those epiphany moments uh, when I realized that I could solve actually almost all of the problems I was interested in at the time if I could just build a powerful evolutionary AI optimization platform, because that's what I needed to solve the problem. So that moment was uh, was pivotal in, uh, in in directing really the rest of my career up till now. Um, I made a, 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 a very crude attempt the next day, uh, which I, I coded in about an hour. Uh, it was actually, <laughs> in retrospect, it was quite terrible, but it was actually, it was wildly successful on the problem that I was working on. It just, like, it just worked after about an hour of work. And that, in particular, reinforced uh, my interest in this area, uh, and it became a, a, it became a, a, a lifelong uh, obsession, really. So at the time, though, um, I estimated this might be a six-month project to build the software, and 22 years later, I still develop the platform and, and regularly add, add features to it. So the mission of this talk is going to be to overview uh, some artificial intelligence techniques that I find useful that you might be able to apply to some of your applications. This is not a comprehensive AI tech uh, talk uh, by any means. I'm not going to be talking about large language models in particular, which uh, I, I find also fascinating. This is going to be more about, um, about kind of numerical techniques, because really a lot of business runs on runs on math and spreadsheets. So many of us here are interested in uh, in these kinds of methods. So um, I'm going to be talking about some very general principles, so just a basic introduction to what optimization is uh, in math, science, business and AI. Uh, I'm going to talk about AI guided evolutionary optimization. And by the end of the talk, you're going to know what that means. Um, I'm going to introduce you to multi-objective optimization for business and engineering. Uh, this is an underappreciated area that allows you to optimize more than one uh, com competing target function, you know, something that you're trying to optimize um, at the same time. You know, so you often have competing objectives, and you're going to see uh, that there's some really neat methods that you can use for problems where you're trying to, you're trying to optimize more than one thing at the same time. I'll get into some applications also. Uh, I'll talk a bit about time series forecasting as um, uh, as, as optimization. Uh, I'll show you a, a really interesting, at least I think, a really interesting example of a spatial optimization problem. Um, and I'll get I'll, t I'll also then speak about uh, some evolutionary tree-based algorithms that you can use for classification, data modeling, and for making projections. Um, and finally, I'll talk about uh, how we optimize uh, uh, strategies uh, to um, 
uh, to improve uh, revenues in casinos by uh, adding machines and removing them and, and spatially moving them around on the floor. And hopefully uh, there'll be a few minutes for discussion at the, uh, at the end. So we're going to start off with some optimization basics. Okay, so um, this, uh, this cartoon uh, shows this giant machine over here, but it's actually kind of a nice paradigm uh, for an optimization problem. Because if you look down at the bottom, um, you have, uh, you've got a bunch of these workers playing around with knobs on this machine. Um, there's somebody at the top who I decide it looks like they're just monitoring the performance. Uh, that's kind of like the objective function. So these guys down here playing with the knobs, they're, they're changing decision variables. The machine does whatever it does. It's just a black box in this case. But at the top, you know, there's somebody recording the output from the machine. And also a machine like this probably has all kinds of physical constraints, which are also typical in, um, in optimization problems. So I think it's kind of a nice paradigm uh, for, optimiz for optimization. Now, everyone thinks they know what optimization is. <clears throat> but I find that the term is often used uh, quite loosely in, uh, in business. When, when people in business say optimization, sometimes they mean they're just looking at some data and deciding on what they consider to be an optimal plan. Um, they might they might have a spreadsheet uh, representing some kind of a financial model, and they play around with the numbers representing key decision variables in order to maybe maximize revenue projections or some key performance indicator, or maybe minimize expenses or something like that. Um, they might make some graphs, uh, visualize the performance metrics, and just look at the graph and try to use that to make a decision. Uh, they might be optimizing a new business location, you know, again by looking at maps and doing some research. So, you know, this is all valid. But today I'm going to be talking more about, you know, really optimization from a more mathematical standpoint, you know, where we actually are going to use some algorithms to try to help uh, make these kinds of decisions um, that were that I spoke about up here. Um, one of the things that comes up all the time in, in, in science, business, math, every field that uses optimization is how do you know that your solution is actually optimal? Are there better solutions out there that you simply haven't found? And how can you find them? Um, these turn out to be complicated questions, which I think you'll appreciate as I get deeper into the material. Anytime you use a phrase like maximize, minimize, or best, you know, usually in the co context of like the best solution, design, plan, strategy, you're really talking about optimization. F fundamentally, uh, every engineering or product design problem is fundamentally an optimization problem because you always have you always have specific goals that you're tr you're trying to accomplish. Usually, you're trying to maximize the performance of whatever you're engineering. Uh, and, and certainly you're always trying to minimize your expenses. And that's an example of a typical multi-objective uh, optimization problem where you've got these two competing objectives, uh, make it good, but also make it cheaply. And I'll, I'll show you how to handle those uh, in a little while. Um, near, nearly all data modeling and forecasting problems are also optimization problems. So if I have some kind of a mathematical model and I'm trying to fit it to some data, uh, there, there are almost always some free parameters uh, that you can turn like the knobs on my machine in order to fit the data. Of course, any model like that also has to respect all constraints, um, which can add additional uh, complications to it. So the only reason I use nearly here, by the way, is that you occasionally do run into uh, models that simply don't have any free parameters, but those are few and far between. Usually there's something you can tweak. Um, business decisions. Uh, optimization comes up all the time. Uh, you, you know, you're, we're always trying to maximize revenue while minimizing risk or costs or something else. Um, and also it's notable that optimization drives the training of artificial intelligence systems such as chat GPT, LLMs and other, and other AI techniques. So optimization is frankly everywhere and it's important that we have some grasp on what this is. So here's a, a very, very simple example of an optimization problem. Um, simple enough that you can see where the, what the solution is. Um, so this is to illustrate the difference between a local minimum and a global minimum in, a, in an optimization problem. This could really represent anything. This could represent financial forecasts where you're trying to optimize your revenue. It could be anything. Um, it's easy to see the solution uh, in a simple example like this, but it's more challenging um, in, uh, in real life problems. You know, an example of that from Real AI, our product for, uh, uh, for optimizing slot floors, is that you know, it's relatively easy to find a, a good configuration, but it's much harder to find the best one. And even when you find the one you think is best, you're never quite sure that it really is, but it's certainly a lot better than the ones that you can find easily. Um, avoiding uh, local minimum traps is key, a key feature of good optimization algorithms. And I'll show you what happens here with this uh, search point here. And I'm going to go hunting around with a really simple optimization algorithm. All I'm doing here is I'm looking down, seeing which way 
the ground slopes away, slopes down the fastest, and I go in that direction, and not surprisingly, um, I get stuck in uh, in this local minimum solution, and I completely miss the better solution out here because that's the one I really want to find. It's the the the, the deepest solution in the uh, in the problem. So. If, uh, you know, if I want to avoid these kinds of traps, there's, certain, there's some things that I can do. Uh, and th these, these are features that you see uh, even, in, even in more elaborate optimization algorithms. So here, all I did is I just added some random noise as I was hunting for my solution. You see it jitters around and then, hey, look, it made it over the hump. The random jitter managed to bounce it over, over the hump and I found the true solution to my problem. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit to you, uh, I slightly, uh, slightly cherry-picked, whoops, I slightly cherry picked uh, this particular run. Uh, more more often than not, it still fails uh, to find the solution. Uh, but we can improve on that. Uh, we can have multiple agents uh, searching simultaneously to improve the certainty that we're going to find uh, that uh, that global minimum. So here I've got a bunch of them looking, and a few of them manage to make it make it make their way over the hump, and they find the true solution uh, without too much trouble. So as soon as I've got uh, multiple agents uh, hunting at the same time for, for the best solution to my problem, that certainly helps greatly. And finally, if I add some communication between them, now we've actually got a pretty good algorithm for finding that global minimum. Again, start off with 25 agents and they go hunting around. A few of them make it over the hump. And you'll see that by the end of it, they've all communicated to the ones left in the local, trapped in the local minimum, that the best solution is down at the bottom. And that kind of, a communica that kind of communication, what it does is it concentrates the, the, the search uh, in good parts of the, uh, of the space. So these three ingredients, um, you know, even in this very, very simple algorithm, um, you'll see in, in more elaborate um, optimization algorithms, basically this idea of randomness helping to explore multiple agents making it more likely to, that you're going to find the best solution and some kind of communication or positive feedback uh, concentrates the search in good parts of the, the space. Now, there's something that you find, you see in optimization literature. Um, is, for a long time, I, I thought this was just mathematical lore, but it's, uh, it, it's actually uh, apparently proven mathematically. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I'm mixing up with the next thing, next thing I'm going to show you, but forget for what I just said. Um, Basically, the curse of dimensionality um, is, is, a, is a broad statement that uh, the optimiz that the difficulty of an optimization problem uh, increases rapidly as the number of decision variables increases. Um, that shouldn't be too surprising. If I've got more knobs on my, sh my machine, that's more like that's like the uh, the x and y coordinates on this graph. And the bigger that space gets, the more knobs you can turn. Uh, the total number of possible configurations increases, and and they increase fast, increase exponentially. So what that means is that once you get past about four or five different uh, variables that you can control, uh, it becomes pretty much impossible to, uh, um, uh, to, to search every single possibility. Um, and um, that means that uh, uh, it, it becomes also impossible to be certain you found the true global solution. Um, as you go to more and more dimensions or more and more uh, decision variables, uh, these local minimum traps become more likely just because there's more, there's more places to hide local minimum. Um, constraints also become harder to satisfy. Um, adding, you know, noisy data also makes it worse. You know, noise uh, just due to, due to uh, you know, bad data or, or just sim simply statistical fluctuations in data can sometimes look like local minima in, in these kinds of problems and simple algorithms get trapped in them easily. So you always need robust techniques to get around these, uh, these local minima. So the key point I'm trying to make here is that optimization problems in general become incredibly difficult uh, when the number of decision variables becomes large. And this is often underappreciated even by, even by scientists. Uh, I, I've had a number of uh, challenging discussions with, uh, with colleagues who are planning to do some kind of a data modeling problem. And I say, well, how are you going to actually you know, fit your model to, to this data? And they say, well, I'm just going to minimize chi-squared. So chi-squared is just a measure of goodness, goodness of fit to a model. And to that, I'll say, well, okay, but how are you going to do that? You know, if, if your model has 30 parameters and it's it's a complicated model with some nonlinear structure, um, you know, you got to think har hard about how you're actually going to find the best solution to the problem. This comes up all the time, and I feel it's quite underappreciated by even scientific professionals. Okay, so this is what I, was, what I, what I started talking about earlier, um, the so-called no-free lunch theorem. And this is a, an interesting statement. Um, 
that I want you to think about for a moment. You know, what it says is that no optimization algorithm is universally better than any other when averaged over all problems. So this is what I, well, this is for a long time I thought was mathematical lore. It's actually proven. Um, and just think about what this means. What this means is that if no optimization algorithm is actually any better than any other on, uh, you know, over the set of all problems, that means that random search or, or a grid, an exhaustive grid search through your space of, of possibilities is, is as good as a state of the art optimizer. And so why bother? You know, it's a very disheartening statement and, and it, and it's true. Okay. So here, here's the catch though. So if you look, consider all possible 2d problems, you know, one of which I've, I've just simply plotted up here. Most of them look like this. Remember, I'm talking about all possible problems, not just the ones that have structure. So in this particular problem, uh, there's no structure or hints anywhere about where the global minimum resides. Uh, and essentially, the, the, you know, the only strategy you can deploy in a problem like this is just simply try points until you land on the true solution, which is this lowest point here on the graph. A very boring optimization algorithm, but it's actually the best you can do on a problem like this that has no structure. Now, the thing is, no free lunch theorem is correct. Um, but it's not really useful or even very applicable in the real world. And the reason for that is that the problems that we care about in, in science, business, engineering, any, any field of human endeavor is that they, they all have some structure. And what that means is that there are hints throughout the space about which way you should go to find uh, the best solutions. And what that means is that some algorithms, algorithms perform better than others on these problems. Now, with, you know, with the no free lunch theorem resolved, I feel a little comforted that the problems that we were trying to actually solve are not average and they actually, uh, there actually are good algorithms. There still are some unsettling facts about optimization. So in a real world, difficult problems, um, you, you seldom really know at the end if you found the true global solution. You, you think about that for a moment. How, how would you actually know? Okay. If you want to find a guaranteed optimal solution, that would require an exhaustive search where you go in and look through every single possibility uh, to find the best model. Uh, and as I pointed out, that's only feasible for very low dimensional problems. So you, you can do that in, you know, in a, in a problem with only, with, a, with only one, um, um, with only one uh, decision variable, two decision variables, three decision variables. That by the time you get to four, it's starting to get pretty hard to do that. Five, you know, you might, you're starting to think twice about it. when you get up to six, seven, eight dimensions, it basically becomes possible just because of the sheer amount of computing that's required. So in real problems with a lot of parameters, a lot of decision variables, um, you're never really sure that you found the true best solution out there. The best that you can say is that your solution is better than any other known solutions. And fortunately that's often good enough. Um, Next point, um, the best optimization methods uh, for hard problems are, are usually based on what I call experimental mathematics, not, not strict mathematical proof. So, you know, I was trained as a physicist. I like proving things. I like knowing why things work. I like, uh, you know, having a, a, a clear theorem telling me how long it's going to take for my, my algorithm to find the best solution. Uh, and you simply can't in this kind of field. Um, you, you, you just have to live with this. Um, and be, uh, uh, be happy that if your method produces better solutions than others, uh, that's good. And in such a case, does provability actually matter? Um, another unsettling fact is that good algorithms use random, randomness heavily. Even the very simple algorithm that I, slowed, that I showed a few slides back with the red dot on the, uh, on the curve. Um, the, you know, part of the solution to finding uh, the, the, true, so the true global minimum um, was randomness. Okay, so good out, good optimization, good optimization algorithms um, use randomness heavily. Um, what that implies is that uh, results can vary between uh, between different attempts at solving a problem, and there's also a certain amount of serendipity uh, in finding your solution. And some people don't like that. I've had conversations even with large companies um, where I was encouraging the use of these kinds of uh, uh, of algorithms that I'm talking about today that use a certain amount of randomness and they simply found it too unpalatable to use in their products. But, you know, the way I think about it is you either deal with this, you know, you either accept that uh, randomness is core to, you know, good algorithms, or you simply use uh, a weaker method. And, you know, in such a case, you're not going to find uh, solutions that are as good as what can be done with state-of-the-art methods.
So I'm going to move on into some applications now that we have uh, an idea of what optimization is all about. I'm going to start by talking about uh, time series forecasting as optimization. So time series forecasting is a, a very common application in, in data science and actually really any, any field of science or math or business. You know, we, we'd all like to be able to forecast our revenue. Uh, we don't, we, we want to forecast uh, our key performance indicators. Maybe uh, we want to we want to uh, forecast uh, stock prices. Uh, all kinds of things. So anytime you have a a, a time series, basically just a, a, a sequence of points um, where the uh, the value attached to those points is varying, you've got a forecasting problem. Um, and the the basic idea in forecasting is that the past behavior predicts the near future. So think about that for a moment. You know, it's basically a statement that uh, most of the series that we're interested in are not random. Uh, there's some structure there, and what's happened in the past is a good predictor of what happens in the in the future. And that's often that's often a valid a valid assumption. So, the goal in time series forecasting is to find the optimal model that best predicts future data points. And there are lots of techniques you can use for this. Um, some of the, the the more common techniques that you'll see are um, are so called uh, the so called autoregressive models, and they come in a, a, a whole bunch of different flavors, uh, such as AR, ARMA, ARIMA, and a whole lot of other ones. Um, in these uh, uh, acronyms, uh, AR means autoregressive. Autoregressive MA means that a moving average is taken somewhere in the algorithm, and the I stands for integrated. Uh, in the case of uh, of ARIMA models, basically in those models, what you're doing is you're you're adding some additional uh, steps to make sure that the series that you're modeling uh, is is statistically stationary. So that's kind of a uh, a more technical point. But the point is that all these models uh, fundamentally uh, use an, use this notion that the next data point is is a function of the current data point, the previous one, the one before that, the one before that, the one before that, etc. So in other words, the recent past behavior predicts the near future. Uh, there's a completely different approach uh, that uh, is quite popular using uh, Facebook's profit tool. Um, this is uh, the versions of it for R and Python. I've used the Python one before, not the R one. Uh, I've given you a link to it. It's a it's a very popular code uh, for modeling trends and seasonality. Um, it, uh, despite what I've um, uh, accidentally written here, uh, it does not include autoregressive uh, terms though. So in this particular tool, it's kind of the flip side of autoregressive models. You're assuming that everything is basically uh, uh, seasonal variables uh, plus, um, uh, uh, plus things like special dates impacting your, uh, your series. So I'll show you how I, how I like to do uh, forecasting. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I built a, a fairly straightforward code uh, for doing forecasting a while back because I needed it for the, uh, the work that we're doing with, uh, with casinos. And uh, I basically combined the best of the best of uh, um, of, of worlds from uh, the uh, uh, the autoregressive models and the and the, uh, the more seasonality focused models uh, like profit. And so what I have uh, is a code that does autoregression. Uh, it, it does some things with moving averages. It takes into account trends, takes into account seasonalities, takes into account special dates, which are which is especially important for. Uh, uh, for the casino industry, because you know, lots of people like to show up on Mother's Day and New Year's, for example. So, lots of different different pieces go into this model, and really, the key uh, to finding a good model that fits your data uh, is an efficient search over all these terms to find the best model. And you'll notice that I use the word best. So, as soon as I say the word best, you know that there is an optimization problem lurking here. And essentially, uh, the goal is then to go and hunt through all these different possibilities of autoregressive terms. You know, you know which, which lags in the autoregressive sequence are uh, are important. Uh, how how much you know how much do you smooth your data with moving averages? You know, what, you know where are the trends? Where are the seasonality? So lots and lots of different different terms uh, go into these models, and you simply go hunting around for them, and you have to do it efficiently because there's a lot of them. Um, baked into it uh, is also this concept of parsimony. And that's a notion that you see all over uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. This notion that smaller models with fewer terms uh, generalize better. So, you know, if I have a, a series like the one I'm showing here, and I have a model with a thousand different, different terms, uh, I'll be able to fit that series almost exactly. However, it won't have any predictive value because it doesn't generalize well. So what we do is we, uh, we basically... Uh, you know, add series, uh, you know, add terms to our series, and we look for uh, the point where the 
on the training uh, data, it's kind of leveling off. And then on the testing data, basically applying uh, the uh, uh, the model to data that the uh, the series has that that the model hasn't seen uh, before. Uh, I'm looking for uh, for a minimum uh, here in the uh, in the testing data, and you can see here that the best model has uh, uh, has eight terms, and I went with that for the graphs that I produced on the uh, the right. Now, now, some of you who are uh, uh, who actually do these kinds of things might be questioning why my testing data has lower error than my training. Uh, da uh, data. Uh, it's just it's just an artifact of this particular series. There's a lot of funny stuff happening at the beginning of the series that got that, that affected the uh, the training data. It wasn't present in the testing data. And uh, really, the key the key thing is that there's a there's a, a, a well defined minimum uh, in the in the error in the the data that it hasn't seen before. The data that it hasn't seen before, by the way, is everything to the right of this uh, this dashed line. And you can see uh, that uh, you know the model. Uh, in red seems to kind of follow the data in blue. Maybe that's a little bit unclear due to the uh, scale. But if I zoom in on a, on a part of the uh, the data that it hasn't seen before, it becomes a lot more clear. Um, you see here that uh, the blue curve, is, the, the red curve is closely following the blue curve, um, and the uh, the green bars that's from uh, a Monte Carlo uh, error error analysis that I used to establish confidence bounds. So in this particular case, this was a uh, just a one day look ahead model for uh, casino attendance. And what I mean by that is I'm trying to predict, you know, how many people are going to come to the casino uh, tomorrow. And the, uh, the, green, uh, the green region uh, includes 90% 90, 90 of the, uh, the data. So I expect that 90% of the time, um, uh, the, uh, the actual number of people tomorrow should be within the green region. And so this actually worked really well. Interestingly, on this particular problem, uh, Facebook's profit uh, tool did not work very well because most of the uh, uh, the series uh, is uh, most of the terms that that were quite required uh, were autoregressive terms, uh, which uh, profit doesn't do. Uh, it actually didn't pick out any seasonal terms for this for this particular model, but they do come up in other at other times. So <clears throat> I'm going to move on to talk about a, a different kind of optimization that I've been in. That I've been involved in uh, uh, about a year or so ago. I'm going to talk about spatial optimization. So I, I like spatial problems. You know, part of our real AI uh, slot for optimization is is a spatial tool. Uh, by the way, where we actually move machines around on the floor to increase uh, increase revenues. Uh, this is very different, though. Uh, what I'm looking at here is um, <clears throat> is optimizing uh, business locations. So this is a problem that comes up uh, for anybody starting a new business. So we where is the best location for a new store or branch? Uh, in this case, in a, uh, for a multi-location business. Yeah, the multi-location business, that's kind of, uh, kind of important in this case because it, the technique relies on having some internal, internal data telling you about your business performance data uh, by location. So what I, what I did here is uh, I looked at uh, Canadian census data um, and, um, uh, and also uh, map data uh, from OpenStreetMap. And essentially what you do is you, you go and download uh, all the Canadian census data. It's got something like about a thousand different fields that could potentially be impacting business performance. And it's all, it's all spatially located. So, you know, we, when, when census data is published, you have uh, different, uh, different regions at different uh, levels of granularity. And in this case, it shows kind of a middle, a middle uh, of the, the road level of granularity um, in order to find predictors that seem to impact uh, business performance uh, by location. Um, the uh, the map data, as I said, came from uh, OpenStreetMap. Um, after after trying a, a number of other services, which were either expensive or prohibited offline storage uh, uh, of data for analysis, I settled on OpenStreetMap, uh, which is just a superb tool. It's free to use uh, and it's powerful and has very few restrictions on on use. So it's just ideal for this kind of a project. So <clears throat> the strategy then that I that I deployed was first of all, you optimize the model. So you find the most impactful predictors of business performance, and then you weight, you weight them accordingly to build your model. Um, you find the optimal trade-off between the model error and number of terms, much as I did on the previous slide here. Um, well, what I'm trying to do is something very similar to this, where I'm trying to find a model that has the fewest possible terms that explain the, that explain the data. And then finally, now that I've got a model in hand that seems to fit uh, the data that I have from, uh, from this company, um, what I want to do is I want to predict uh, performance across the entire map, even including places where uh, where they don't currently have a location. So uh, these are some of the features uh, that I used in the model. Um, basically, uh, what I did here 
is I, I, I mocked up some artificial data for a major convenience store chain. Um, no particular reason. And I was also, I also assumed it was in the greater Vancouver area uh, because the, uh, the partners I was working with at the time uh, were focused on that area. So what I did is uh, I, I looked at um, census data uh, as well as the, uh, the map data. And for the map data in particular, um, I, I boil it down to a spatial density of other businesses and services, services, including some that are complementary and some that might be antagonistic to the business uh, and calculated the number of locations per square kilometer. So these are the kinds of businesses that I looked at. Uh, there were uh, uh, cannabis shops, uh, supermarkets, pubs, bars, supermarkets, restaurants, cafes, gas stations, all kinds of things, uh, including even things like uh, the location of, uh, of ATMs. And you throw it all in there, uh, you put it on the same footing as the census data. After I did a little filtering, I had about 630 uh, census fields. You put it all into the model. And most of these fields don't actually matter, but some do. And then the challenge is figuring out what matters and, and what doesn't in constructing your final model. So um, this is what I ended up with. Um, essentially, what you get as an output is, uh, is, is a set of optimal locations uh, map, placed on a map. So here I use the visualization technique. So what you're looking at here is hotter colors like yellows and whites. Uh, those are the optimal, lo optimal locations for your new, your new business. Um, and you can literally just pick them off by looking at the map at this point. Uh, it also, I also export a spreadsheet. Uh, this is not very interesting in its own right down here, but uh, uh, basically it tells you, uh, all, it tells you the, uh, the, the expected performance of a business as a function of uh, the geographical uh, identifier. So I'm going to move on and talk about a different kind of optimization here. You know, one that's really core to my, my own interests. Um, I'm going to talk about evolution as nature's optimization algorithm. And so um, just looking at this figure here, I think it's fascinating. Uh, this is an early depiction of the so-called tree of life. And this goes back to uh, Haeckel's work in 1866. I'm not going to attempt to, uh, uh, to say this, uh, the title in, in German, but it translates to general morphology of organisms. And so you can see here that there's kind of this notion that, you know, the base of the tree of life is kind of simple things like, uh, like single celled organisms. And then we kind of branch off into plants, um, uh, protozoans uh, and, and animals. You know, we're way up here in the, uh, in the vertebrates. But basically along this, uh, this path, you have organisms occupying all kinds of different, different niches. Um, and what, why is that? You know, what, what, are, what are organisms trying to do? Well, they're trying to ultimately survive. So evolution is an al is, can be thought of as an algorithm that over long periods of time and lots of lots of experiments with, with organisms causes them to settle down into uh, different niches where they're more likely to survive. survive. So essentially, it's optim optimizing survival. So evolutionary algorithms are a very broad field of AI uh, based on principles inspired by biological evolution. So you'll have you know, populations of organisms, or, or in this case, agents that evolve uh, via mutation, reproduction, and natural selection to optimize their own survival. In this case, survival is tied to, uh, uh, to a fitness function, basically a simulation or a math model that we're trying to optimize. Um, and uh, the, the whole field is based around uh, mimicking these kinds of evolutionary processes, uh, often, often quite loosely, uh, to solve computational problems. So, this field provides uh, especially powerful uh, AI tools for doing things like any kind of optimization problem, as well as data modeling and classification, which are, you know, frankly, those are, those are also basically optimization problems. So incredibly powerful algorithms that can be used for all kinds of things. And this is essentially uh, the platform that I've been building since uh, 2002. So within uh, uh, evolutionary optimization, there are lots of subfields and applications. Uh, the earliest uh, uh, evolutionary algorithm was the, the so-called genetic algorithm, which many of you have probably heard about. Um, <clears throat> this was a, uh, a, a classic uh, bit string uh, algorithm based on, on literally ones and zeros, which was invented by uh, John Holland from uh, University of Michigan in the early 1970s and became popular uh, in 1975 uh, in his book, Adaptation in Natural and Artificial Systems. So... Um, this field goes uh, far beyond genetic algorithms, though. Um, there are uh, all kinds, all kinds of, uh, of different uh, subfields and applications. Uh, we hardly ever use uh, these kind of bit string approaches anymore, but um, 
similar principles apply to modern evolutionary algorithms. A couple of examples are evolution strategies and differential evolution. And there, if, if you want, if you're interested in this at all, uh, there, there are a number of uh, useful Python tools in uh, scikit-learn. Uh, one example, uh, which would be a good place to start, is sklearn genetic uh, opt. And so you can simply import that into Python and play around with it uh, if you wish. One of the key points that I want to make, though, is that uh, this kind of optimization that I'm talking about here, it's really for problems that have an underlying math model. Okay, So I'm going to show you later a very different approach that doesn't require an underlying math model. Why is that important? Sometimes you have uh, an understanding of you know, the, the, the structure of your problem and you have uh, an idea of how, of how things work and you just simply want to optimize that. Sometimes you have no idea. And in that case, you use more of a machine learning technique that doesn't require an initial model to, uh, to optimize. So my, uh, my code uh, uh, called Cubist um, shares some features with, uh, with evolution strategies and differential evolution. Uh, plus, it's it's kind of a kitchen sink model because over the years I've added all kinds of things because I keep encountering uh, features and problems, and of course I want my code to be able to solve them. So it's you know Cubist supports uh, categorical and cyclic variables. Cyclic variables are basically uh, you know things like uh, uh, like like degrees, where zero degrees and three hundred sixty degrees are really the same thing. Uh, there's a whole constraint management system which has been incredibly important for uh, work in the casino industry. Basically, you know tell, telling the code how to avoid uh, regions that it simply aren't allowed for some particular reason. Uh, it's, a, it's a fully multi-objective code, which I'm, I'll, I'll talk about uh, in a little while. Uh, it can optimize uh, multiple target functions simultaneously. So I, I can literally tell it to, uh, uh, to, to maximize uh, the, uh, the efficiency of my product while minimizing its cost, and I get a trade-off surface out of it. Um, it's uh, a parallel code, which is really important because um, these kinds of techniques, you want, they require a lot of computing. And if you can split up that computing across uh, many cores in your computer, uh, there's a huge benefit in doing that. Um, and also, it has a couple of embedded AI systems that have been really important in, in boosting uh, Cubist power. Um, it has a, a self-adaptation AI. So while it's running, it's actually building a model of its own performance and optimizing its own performance uh, on the problem that it's working on. So it's kind of like a self-reflection happening uh, while the code is running. And uh, the more important AI is uh, the linkage learning uh, system, which is really a divide and conquer, conquer kind of strategy. Essentially, if you got a really big problem, if you can break that down into smaller sub problems, you can then kind of solve those quasi independently and stitch together the full solution. So this code does that while it's running. Uh, it, it does it completely automatically. And it's basically looking for opportunities to simplify the problem so that it can, it can find the solution more efficiently and handle larger problems. So there, there are enormous efficiency gains through linkage learning, as well as somewhat through this the self-adaptation. Now, as I said, this is a multi-objective code. And most real-world problems have multiple objectives. Uh, all good engineering and project all, all engineering and project design problems, for example, you always want to make it good but make but minimize the cost. Uh, in business, we want to maximize revenue but minimize risk maybe. Uh, and in our in, in, in the real AI sloth floor optimization, we want to maximize gaming revenue, but minimize the number of purchases or moves. So evolutionary codes are just ideal for these kinds of multi-objective problems. And this is an illustration of what that what that means. So here I'm imagining that we're we're designing a, a widget and we want to make the widgets have as high quality as possible. But we want to keep the cost low. And you can ask the question, you know, what what is the optimal widget that you could design? And it turns out the answer here is actually a whole a whole uh, uh, line of widgets on my graph here uh, that have the property that you can't improve the quality without decrease without increasing the cost, and you can't decrease the cost without sacrificing some quality. So the best widget here is really uh, it's really uh, chosen from uh, a whole set of them along the curve over here, and that's important because what it means is that if you have a code that can discover that whole the structure of that trade-off surface. You can then uh, go at it, go look at it after the fact, uh, in order to figure out which one you actually want to use. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears to uh, non-parametric uh, 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 models now, um, where we have um, we're going to use some tree-based approaches. And I'm going to introduce you to another another one of my my favorite tools that I've been building over the past few years uh, called Bonsai. Uh, this is uh, tree-based evolutionary optimization for segmentation and data modeling. I also consider it to be sort of a rule discovery engine, and you'll see what I mean by that when I apply it to uh, casinos. So 
<clears throat> Bonsai is a, it's a tree-based uh, evolutionary, evolution, evolutionary AI that automatically does a couple of different things. Uh, it, you can use it, you can set it up to uh, optimally classify or segment data, or you can set it up uh, to build a human understandable model for data uh, without requiring any underlying math model. So basically it's building, what it does is really, is it's building a program to describe your data. And then you can use that program express as a tree structure to, uh, to then classify uh, uh, new data coming in or make, or make predictions. So I, uh, I keep finding more uses for this code. Initially I built it for uh, our work in uh, uh, with slot floor optimization, but I'm finding all kinds of new things to do with it. Things like, you know, obviously segmenting slot machines for real AI, which is the original use. Um, segmenting customers based on gaming preferences and demographics, using that to predict their, predict their spend, uh, predicting slot revenues, predicting player behavior, predicting sports betting behavior, predicting customer response to marketing campaigns, classifying business transactions, and even things like segmenting inventory and predicting profitability of items. So it's a really versatile code. And as I said, I just keep finding more uses for this thing. Um, I'm going to show you like like the, the simplest possible example of using Bonsai. So I built this a while back to explain uh, the code um, to uh, to a group that was less familiar with, uh, with you know with algorithms and tech. And what I did is I, I classified Canadian coins. So the goal here was to automatically generate the simplest possible tree to classify Canadian coins using easily measured attributes such as their size, their mass, their color. You know, is there milling? Is there milling on the on the edge of the coin, etc. I even threw in some some error on the diameter, thickness, and mass. And in the end, uh, what it did is it came up with uh, this as its simplest tree. So it starts off by asking the question: Does the coin is the coin faceted or is it round? Okay, you go one way, you ask which color it is, and then you've got two different classes over here. Um, one of these will be uh, probably pennies; the other will be uh, will be loonies. They're not labeled, unfortunately. Um, over here, these are the uh, the ones that are just sim uh, silver; they're not colored. You ask next, is the edge milled? And that gives you some additional classes. Uh, is there an animal on the back of the coin? And then finally, what's the coin's mass? And so in doing this, it looked at, I'd say a few thousand different possible uh, tree structures to describe uh, the data um, and uh, settled on this as the one that, uh, that, that, was, that was simplest that uh, also describes the data to very high accuracy. Essentially 100% of the coins were classified right. This is uh, bonsai applied to something a little more elaborate. Uh, in this case, um, uh, uh, slot machines. While it's running, you can see, you know, all of this crazy activity up here, where I, it's trying out different things, and it's building this trade-off curve. In this case, between segmentation error and the total number of um, of, of segments or classes. Um, here, I'm calculating the uh, the Gini coefficient because it's just basically saying that uh, uh, I I want I don't want to have uh, models that are enormously different in size. And eventually it settles down. I, I stop the code and I go and pick a point off of the curve and I can then visualize it. And you can see that it's built quite a complicated looking, uh, looking uh, uh, tree to describe slot machines. And again, I want to emphasize that a tree like this is really a program um, because it amounts to the, the set of decisions you would make in classifying a slot machine. I can then go and poke around in here and look at uh, uh, some of the different classes. And then finally, at the end, uh, I, I export my I export the whole thing as a spreadsheet, and it comes out as an Excel sheet and just a flat CSV file. Uh, the first page it's a definition of the the, the classes, um, and then we look at the the individual segments. I'm using segments and classes uh, interchangeably here, so it's uh, it's pretty easy to run, and uh, uh, it makes it attractive uh, for using it all kinds of uh, problems. So I'm going to move into the uh, really the last part of the talk, just taking a quick look at what we like to call the science of slots. Um, essentially, treating uh, the slot floor as a massive scale optimization problem uh, requiring multiple AI systems. And here you're going to see the AIs I've already introduced you to all working together, plus another one that I haven't talked about uh, to solve this, uh, this massive problem. So the goal of, uh, of real AI it's, uh, it's, it's very simple. It's to tell casino operators which machines to buy, which ones to remove from the floor, and, and where to put them. So uh, I'm sure many of you realize that casinos collect a lot of data. Uh, every single slot machine transaction is recorded. That includes the number of games played, the amount bet, um, which we call coin in, the amount won, which we call coin out, uh, properties of slot machines, and the location and availability of every slot machine at all times going back many years. Um, 
these uh, 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 transactions uh, are also uh, attached to, to a player card number for players that, that use them, which is typically anywhere from about 40 to about 65%. Sometimes you see a little higher or a little lower. Uh, this is a, a visual representation of what the data looks like. I call this the time stream. Uh, here we have um, about six months worth of data. In reality, this, this would go back um, uh, many years, typically. And you can see here that I have uh, the status of the machine. Is it available or not? Uh, is it occupied? And then the total amount of money going in and out of the machine, as well as the total attendance uh, in, in the casino, which we model out from this, uh, this data. So it's quite, it's quite complicated data. To this, you also add all the slot machine properties. And you know our viewpoint on this problem is that Casino Floor is really kind of an ecosystem where you have all kinds of complicated interactions between players and machines um, uh, and all the components on the slot floor. You know, For example, a player can't play a machine that somebody's already sitting at. Um, players are also somewhat fl fluid in their game choices. So if their chosen machine isn't available, uh, what will they choose? Um, if you add in product placement, uh, that adds another layer of complexity. Um, and overall, the, the, the underlying model, it's, it's really large and very nonlinear. And untangling uh, the data to understand the actual dynamics happening on the floor uh, requires uh, some pretty sophisticated mathematical approaches, as well as powerful AI systems. So this shows you the AI, uh, the AI uh, that goes into uh, real AI. Here's my bonsai code here representing uh, how we segment slots. Uh, I showed you my Cubis code, which does the uh, the modeling in the end. This is one I didn't talk about. This is basically uh, behavioral segmentation, which sorts players into uh, into different player profiles with similar interests. So you put this all together, um, and uh, you turn on Cubis, and it goes hunting around for slot plans, um, based, basically telling us the purchases, removals, and spatial moves, testing millions of configurations in the process. Um, it's hunting again for this, this optimal trade-off curve that simultaneously maxes, maximizes slot revenue and minimizes purchases or possibly changes on the floor. Um, and of course, satisfies all the constraints that we get from, uh, from slot floor managers. There are always capacity limits, machines that can't be removed because it's some VIP's favorite machine. Uh, there are legacy machines that can't be purchased. So it's just, a, it's just an absolute minefield of constraints, which is why, you know, largely why uh, Cubist has this powerful constraint management system built, baked right into it. So you put it all together and you've got three different AIs talking to each other uh, to build a really a state-of-the-art slot floor, slot floor model that we can then use for optimization. Benefits to casinos are uh, very significant. Um, you know, the biggest benefit is it saves time and effort for, uh, for slot professionals by giving them pre-optimized plans to choose from. Um, probably more importantly, we can easily find 10% increase in slot revenue uh, by doing this and, and optimizing their floor carefully. Typical slot machine makes about $250 a day. So for a small casino, that amounts to $2.3 million per year uh, improvement. And for the large ones, uh, the amounts become uh, extremely high. Uh, this is what the output looks like uh, from Real AI. You know, really one of the, uh, the things that we learned building this is that even though what's happening under the hood is extremely complex and sophisticated, what they really want is just simple output. You know, so we, in the early days of this, we were building uh, uh, Microsoft BI uh, dashboards and and you know, more elaborate reports, all kinds of things. Um, but in the end, what they really want is just a spreadsheet uh, with simple instructions. So we give them some simple metrics, and we start off with the trade-off curve. You probably can't read the uh, the labels here, but this is the uplift, and this is the number of changes required. And obviously, as you increase the number of changes, the uplift in revenue increases. Uh, so you pick a model from anywhere on this curve. Uh, and you get various metrics telling you uh, the uh, the properties of the machines, uh, the anticipated uplift as a projection, and then very, very simple instructions. In this case, remove four of these, add six of these, and you have uh, similar games. Uh, you have games to choose from in, uh, in both. So really simple output um, with a whole lot of computational firepower behind it. So that's really the end of the talk. And I'm just going to... Uh, have one, this one last uh, summary slide. Uh, the key points I tried to make in this talk are that optimization drives all engineering, business, science, and artificial intelligence. It, it, is, it is truly a unifying concept that spans essentially all quantitative uh, human endeavors. And my journey in, uh, in optimization, and especially AI optimization, I think was, uh, was, was rewarding and worthwhile um, because it impacts so many different fields of human endeavor. 
uh, you are benefiting uh, or using directly using optimization every day, uh, whether you realize it or not. Um, optimization in particular drives the training of AI systems, which uh, has become increasingly important in recent years. And none of this would be possible without powerful uh, AI powered optimization methods. And so I think we probably have a few minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for, uh, for attending my talk and letting me share this uh, material with you. Thank you. Yes, a round of applause, please, for Jason Figa. Um, Dr. Figa, that was incredible. I'm, I was listening and thinking about how you took something so incredibly complex, or it sounds very complex for, for folks who don't have, you know, a PhD in astrophysics and, and, and work with the guts of algorithms on a daily basis. But And you talked about it in a way that's very actionable. Um, you went over three applications, time series forecasting, spatial optimization, and then the evolutionary as nature's optimization algorithm, which I thought was really fascinating in particular. Are there certain types of industries that you think are ripe for any of these three optimization um, models? Well, uh, I think what do you look to and you think, oh man, I would love to get in there. Um, well, I mean, this is, this is why we chose the casino industry. Um, around 2016, because we, we saw that field as, as ripe for more powerful techniques. So the, the fields that, you know, where you could, you could have a, like, a, like a massive impact uh, quickly are really the ones that um, aren't, do, aren't using sophisticated algorithms yet. Uh, those are becoming fewer and fewer um, between. So in this day and age, I think, uh, I think every field can benefit from powerful optimization algorithms. Um, but I think we're starting to see more and more uh, of this kind of data science oriented optimization approach in, uh, in all kinds of different industries. So I, I think the, uh, you know, the future is going to be more incremental improvements in, in what these industries are doing, but I don't see a whole lot of fields anymore where they're just not doing anything where you can just revolutionize the whole field by coming in with, with powerful techniques like I've shown you today. And isn't that a relief, right? <laughs> 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 it's, it's a very good thing. Absolutely. Um, I'm just looking here at the Q&A tab that we have, um, and there are two questions in particular. The, the first one, um, which has been um, uploaded, says, could you quickly review where we can find the free public tools for the different types of optimization? For example, the forecasting, the genetic algorithm, and the spatial optimization. Yeah, there, there are various, uh, various Python libraries that you can look at. I th let me see, see if I can quickly find... Uh, and we'll fine. post, um, if not in the chat, we'll we'll follow up afterwards with um, participants any of the information here as well. Yeah, I mean for the evolutionary optimization stuff, there there's uh, you can look in Scikit-Learn, for example. Um, there's one in particular here that seems oops that's quite commonly used, um, SK-Learn genetic op. Uh, that would be a good place to start uh, with this kind of thing. Um, Facebook profit uh, is a good one to look at. I mean, it's not auto not auto regressive, um, but um, it's it's very useful for a lot of applications that have more of like a like like a periodicity to them um, or or seasonality. Um, these tools are are really uh, everywhere. Um, my own tools they're unfortunately not not public domain, but um, you know I'm open to collaborations if that's of interest. So. Um, I can give you a more comprehensive answer if they, you know, if they write, if they send me an email um, offline. But I would definitely start with things like uh, like Scikit-Learn, um, and then there are also some statistical packages for Python uh, that do uh, auto regression. I, th I thought I had them in my talk. Um, Stats model, TSA, ARIMA model is a good place to start as well. Um, but if you Google around, you'll you'll find uh, lots of examples of places where you can get started with these kinds of tools. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for that. And again, we'll we'll follow up with um, a lot of that information if it's publicly available for anyone who's interested afterwards. Um, it looks like we've got a couple of other questions here. So I'm going to put in a little caveat here. It says, what factors do companies need as a prerequisite to benefit from AI guided optimization? And so obviously data would be, you know, probably the most important thing, but anything else that comes to mind for organizations that perhaps are getting started with AI optimization? Well, I mean, you need data. Uh, you need uh, a significant, but not not necessarily excessive comp computing. And really, the most important thing is you need personnel. You, you need you need somebody 
who deeply understands these things. Um, there are a lot of a lot of people out in the industry now um, who are you know they have a like like a certificate in data science or something like that. And I, I don't mean you know I'm not going to say bad things about that. That's that's fine, but really um, you know the, the people who understand this kind of stuff deeply and not just simply applying uh, pre-made packages are really the most valuable ones for uh, for getting into this kind of work. So you know I think my uh, you know my my overall response is you know invest invest a little bit in computing um but um also invest in uh um you know in in, in maintaining good data and most importantly invest invest in highly qualified people um who can understand these things it, 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 this is really a field where um a little a little knowledge can be dangerous especially if you're basing uh important business decisions on it so make sure that you've got qualified people that understand what they're doing deeply you know, somebody who's a little bit more than having just been introduced to, you know, to running Python packages, for example. So and I, like an actual degree in data science, um, phys physicists are uh, pick up this stuff extremely well because we're designed, we're, I'm not, not designed, we're, um, we're basically wired um, to, uh, to learn new things and to look at complicated problems and reduce them down to you know, to really understand the the dynamics operating them. So we've had uh, a, a couple other physicists working with us uh, in the past, and they've uh, they've been uh, excellent for uh, for our business. So I think physics physics people, math people, um, you know, computer science people, of course, um, those are really the kinds of people that you want to invest in. Okay, excellent. Um, sounds like we also could, I think, just benefit overall here in Manitoba in particular with better outcomes in math for kids coming out of K to 12, right? Like get that foundation underway and develop that deep interest uh, in math overall. That would be probably yeah, my insight, yeah. especially as a parent. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, putting on my professor hat for a moment, uh, I believe I've seen some decline in, uh, in math skills uh, coming into first year classes. Um, that's not good. You know, it, the world today requires a deep understanding of, of math and algorithms, and most importantly, critical thinking. Uh, and I'm I'm not sure that our our schools are uh, doing as good of a job as they could. Mm -hmm. uh, I think more of a back to basics approach would go a long way in uh, in improving those skills. Perhaps a future panel for um, some experts, you know, so that we can invite some of our stakeholders to to help them to understand the the massive opportunity here with that. In, indeed. Okay, um, we have one last question here. It says, uh, "What about the spatial? What about spatial optimization? Where did you get that data from?" So I'm I'm guessing they're referring to the slide that you had going through your example, and it's probably very proprietary information from working with clients. But I'll I'll I let think, you work on that interpretation of that question. Yeah. Okay. So so the data, uh, it's basically two public source uh, data sources. So Canadian Census data. I, I basically use that as um, uh, as as modeling features to predict um, uh, to predict uh, proprietary business data. So it's Canadian Census data. Um, spatial data uh, came from uh, from OpenStreetMap. There's a there's a, there's a fantastic interface to OpenStreetMap uh, called Overpass. You can call it from Python, and it's it's extremely easy to use. And you can basically just suck down uh, all kinds of information about uh, locations of um, of competing or synergistic businesses. Um, so those two are open source, and then finally, what you need is uh, is proprietary data for a multi uh, like a multi uh, uh, a multi location business of some kind. Now, what I showed you here, this is a uh, uh, this is just mocked up data. So I assumed a uh, uh, I, I assumed a, uh, a convenience store chain. I, I'm not going to put a name on it, but you might be able to guess which con convenience stores in Canada have a lot of different chains. Uh, have, have a lot of different locations. Um, this was mocked up, but I actually I also did this uh, for a real customer uh, in a very different industry uh, with uh, with considerable success in helping them to figure out where to put uh, where to put their branches. So, um, what I showed here mocked up data, but you can use the same technique for real data. But the key point is you do need some uh, uh, some proprietary business data uh, to understand the performance uh, at multiple locations. Okay, excellent. Um, looks like we've had another question that was added on, if you don't mind um, sure. one more. It says, there are many key players in AI. Any advice on what to look for before embarking on this journey? So perhaps it's like the, you know, the chat GBT type of options, but um, 
yeah, any advice? Oh, that's a that's a tough one. Um, it depends strongly on what you're trying to do. Okay, so you know if you're if you're interested in uh, in building applications for LLMs, you know in, in Canada, I think uh, ChatGPT is is really 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 your your only choice for uh, like like a large player. Uh, you can do uh, you can work with uh, smaller uh, LLMs that you can install on your on your hardware. I, I've I've played around with things like. Uh, uh, like Llama on my my own computer, you can basically install it uh, quite quite easily using a tool called uh, called Uba Booga. So I don't know where they come up with these names, but you can install LLMs uh, locally on your own machine, and you can also train them using that tool. So you know things like that are important. Um, you know, in a more broad in a broader uh, 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 marketplace, um, other tools are coming online, most notably from uh, from Anthropic for LLMs. Uh, if we go beyond LLMs. You know, it really becomes very specific to what you're what you're trying to do. There are, there are excellent tools uh, that you can use in in Python. Uh, I'm a heavy user of MATLAB. I actually don't use their optimization platform because I built my own, um, but uh, they do have they do have an optimization platform uh, as well as a uh, uh, as well as a machine learning uh, toolbox that you can add in. So really, it just depends on on what you're trying to do, um, what kind of software your team is is familiar with. Uh, also comes into play and. Uh, other than that, I think, um, you know, if I, if I had a better idea of, of the application, I might be able to offer some some more specific advice. But clearly, understand what, what you're doing, what you're trying to do before you actually go out and uh, and start doing it. And any final thoughts uh, on AI optimization that um, you wanted to either reiterate or something else that came to mind? Oh, I don't. I don't think there's anything I want to reiterate, uh, especially. Um, I think the summary slide that I had up here really uh, encapsulated a lot of my uh, my views on on the topic. Um, this is these algorithms and techniques are so important to everything that we're doing in modern society. I think it's important to have at least a basic understanding of uh, of what's happening uh, behind the scenes. Um, and I, I hope that uh, the audience can understand my excitement over these kinds of these kinds of techniques. They've been absolutely pivotal in uh, in my own career. Well, Dr. Dr. Uh, Figa, I just want to say again, thank you so much on behalf of Tech Manitoba, our members, those in uh, attendance. Um, I thank you so much for your time, your expertise, your team, uh, and the work that you're doing. I, I was noting as well that we previously had Dr. Gerhard, also from the U of M, uh, the head of the computer, computer science department, um, speak at uh, Lunch and Learn here at Tech Mashup. And so he really gave, sorry, I'm getting all <clears throat> froggy here. He really gave a good overview of AI, and so we've been building on with these tech mashups, different examples from different local experts that we have, such as yourself. And it's quite amazing, actually, how many, you know, AI experts with deep, deep expertise we have from the U of M, um, which is incredible. So, thank you to the U of M and the work that you're doing there, along with, um, you know, Dr. Figa, you and your team, because it's it's really great to see and share some of your expertise with the wider world, so we can have future AI experts be inspired and also want to perhaps work with you one day. So thank you very much. That's fantastic. Th th thanks so much for those comments and uh, and the opportunity to speak today. Our pleasure. And so folks, we've got, um, uh, Shailen's got a link here on the right hand side for any of the previous AI tech mashups that we've had. The recordings can be found on our YouTube playlist. Um, take a look, take a listen. There's tons of great information. Last one was Tim Siemens, uh, the CTO and partner with Online Business Systems, previously Dr. Gerhard, and we'll have um, today's with Dr. Figa posted very shortly. So thank you for everyone in attendance. I also just wanted to share, we've got two very um, exciting events upcoming. One is tomorrow. It is called Plugged In. It's at a cross the board cafe in the Exchange District from 5 to 8 p.m. It's a free event. So if you wanna come network and be a part of the tech community here, if you're thinking about getting into tech, and again, you just want to meet those in the community, come out to Across the Board Cafe. Registration information is available on Tech Manitoba's website under industry events. And then the second event I wanna highlight is our virtual um, job fair that we call Career Connections. The next one happens on April 4th. If you're mid-level to senior tech talent, so probably three and three plus years of experience, doesn't matter what background. Um, we really want to have you in attendance. We've got a number of amazing um, industry who are hiring. So it's a great, uh, efficient way for you to come, 
hear from those companies, meet from hiring managers, and hopefully land yourself a new role in Manitoba's tech community. The second Career Connections is on May the 9th. It's for upcoming grads in Manitoba's tech programming, as well as recent grads. Same premise. Go to the Tech Manitoba website, check out industry events, register, and we hope to have you at um, any of our upcoming events. So thank you again, everyone, for attending. Uh, again, Dr. Figa, thank you so much for your wonderful, wonderful presentation on uh, AI optimization. It truly is something that uh, can benefit all aspects of society. So that's it for today. We will uh, close off and then we'll be virtually ported back to the tables on the Remo floor platform. So thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing you next time around.